Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting and interesting episode of Side Stories. Got a very explosive episode for you today. <laughs> explosive? Yes, it definitely will be. So handle this episode of care. Don't drop it. Don't get it. Uh, don't put it near children or animals. Don't point it at, at don't anyone. Don't point it at anybody, because today we're talking about the first gun in human history. So yes, it's a warfare-based episode, but more talking about the, I guess, research and development side of things today. Yes, we will not be talking about modern arms today, because that's a whole complicated... We could probably do a whole podcast series on modern arms and modern guns. I'm sure there are many great firearm podcasts. Out there. Yes. If you want to learn more, uh, go I'm check sure those out. Find all those. There's great YouTube channels where, like, practically every week they're talking about a new model, this or that. I know Forgotten Weapons on YouTube is pretty good. I've seen like one or two of his episodes. But uh, today we're going to be talking about the most primitive, prototypical quote-unquote guns yes so Darian and i of. started we started mulling over ideas for episodes and we settled on hey what was the first gun in history because that's always an interesting question is what came first so we're gonna go back in time and see if we can pinpoint where things went so first off before we get lost in the weeds here i'm gonna define what a gun is because as it turns out it's surprisingly hard it is shockingly hard and especially again if you're going to talk about modern firearms and everything like that like if you're in the u.s you're going to deal with the atf everyone's Definitely not favor government agency. I'll leave it there before I say too much. <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to become a battle of definitions very quickly. So I tried to find the best, I guess, general uh, definition that I could find that seemed to be pretty consistent across various different dictionaries. I'm using the specific definition from freedictionary.com, by the way. A lot of other places had this, essentially. A gun is a weapon consisting of a metal tube from which a projectile is fired at high velocity into a relatively flat trajectory. So, pretty basic. And you could argue that certain things are or are not guns based on a definition. But just to give everybody that general <laughs> overview, that's what I'm going for. No, to muddy the waters with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, flashing forward in time a little bit, we're also going to be talking about the first cannon as well in yes. our next episode. This is mm -hmm. going to be a, a bit of a two-parter. Yep. And you can actually break down cannons into different different types, one of which is a gun, which is typically considered to be separate from what we consider to be like handheld guns, but also essentially has that exact same definition. It is a, a piece of artillery that is meant to shoot in a relatively flat trajectory as opposed to howitzers and mortars, which both uh, fire at various angles of tra uh, trajectory. Yeah, uh, again, it's going to get... Not confusing, because we're not going to get into all of that, but it can be very confusing if you're trying to study this subject. But I believe Derry and I, and all of our well-done research, as always, have finally figured out the true answer that will clearly satisfy everyone listening to this podcast and beyond. We've closed the case here. Yep. I'm sure <laughs> no one will ever want to debate or figure this out again. This will be the be-all, end-all. There answer. is no clear answer. No. <laughs> No, Darian, we have the clear answer on this podcast. So many ancient civilizations experimented with various weapons uh, that included chemical reactions or simply lighting projectiles on fire. Again, famous examples include Greek fire, flaming arrows. Of course, you can even consider modern flamethrowers in that. And then you can also look back at simply throwing flaming projectiles of a catapult or other device or anything like that. People have always experimented with using fire in combat. So those things are, I guess you considered precursors to you know, modern guns, because again, that fire is one of the main components of an actual gun, or at least the explosive reaction caused by, you know, the chemicals. But these things are not, again, guns themselves. So they, again, they're devastating on a battlefield, but not quite there. So what's the key component that sets guns apart from all of those things, Darian? Can you think of it? Gunpowder, Darian. That's the main thing. So gunpowder is, again, it has gun in the name for a reason. And before anyone tries to be a little pedantic, Yes, I know air rifles are a thing. They came much later. Yes, it counts as a gun. It's its own side thing. I'm not going to talk about that today. Maybe some other day. Put that out of your head. Gunpowder is the main thing that sets guns apart from other kinds of weapons for the purposes of this episode. So again, talking about the history of gunpowder here. Gunpowder was invented in China around 850 AD, roughly. It was accidentally discovered by Chinese alchemists who were looking for a potion that would grant immortality. What they got out of these experiments was gunpowder, which turned out to do the exact opposite of granting immortality, since it tended to cut people's lives very short. In their defense, it could save your life. It could. It could. It, not indefinitely, but <laughs> temporarily, perhaps. Yes, and despite getting the opposite results of what they wanted, that didn't stop the discovery of gunpowder from being very important, because it did change the face of the Earth, in a sense. 
So this early gunpowder, and a lot of gunpowder that went on to follow it, was made out of charcoal, saltpeter, and sulfur. Those are the three key components. If you get just the right combination of those ingredients, which is, it's 75% saltpeter, 15% charcoal, and 10% sulfur. So if any of you are going to go make that, be careful. And you didn't hear it here. I'm pretty sure I was taught that in middle school. Probably. I, yeah, I know. You could say that all you want. I just wanted to, full disclosure, for legal reasons, we are not liable for anything. For If you burn your eyebrows off trying to make your own gunpowder, that's not our fault, okay? Now, if you get, again, 75% saltpeter, 15% charcoal, and 10% sulfur, you produce a rapidly burning mixture, which, when you put it into a confined space, it rapidly la can launch a projectile at very high speeds. Especially for the time, because this was... An incredible reaction. I think about it in 858, you know, I've never seen anything like this before. Mm. The fastest moving objects were thrown by gunpowder. It's like, oh, wow, look, what was that? I mean, it was like magic. This would be like seeing tanks in World War One. Yeah, I know, which, again, we did eventually get tanks by the end of it, but a lot of people were, like, stunned, like, what is this thing coming yeah. at me? They had some frame of reference because machinery was a thing, but, again, the alchemists might have seen, like, some reactions before in their time, but nothing quite like this. This was definitely special. And another thing that makes gunpowder very interesting is that it's relatively inert or at least stable because unless it's ignited or heated up, it's not going to go off while in storage or moved. You can drop like a barrel of gunpowder and typically, assuming nothing's gone horribly wrong, it shouldn't go off, which makes it rather portable and somewhat easy to carry under safe conditions, which again makes it ideal for if you're going to give it to soldiers, they can actually carry it in the field and you don't have to worry about them. Typically, unless they fall into a campfire or something, blowing up. So that's another very important thing that gunpowder has going for it. So the earliest kinds of gunpowder, these mixtures were known as black powder, which is actually a term that came in much later to distinguish it from more modern smokeless gunpowder, which is what we commonly use in bullets today. Various mixes of black powder were created after the discovery in China, and it wasn't until the 1800s that black powder began to be phased out from common use in favor of smokeless mm -hmm. powder. So it's black powder is essentially the main form of gunpowder for about a thousand years. And even today, black powder is still used in some modern firearms, such as in modern muzzle loaders or in replica guns. And to clarify, smokeless powder and black powder are both commonly known, both commonly known as gunpowder. So they're both kinds of gunpowder. Mm -hmm. We're going to be focusing on black powder today. That's usually what you... Like, if you ever watched a movie about, like, say, the Napoleonic Wars, the American Revolution, or pirates or stuff like that, if they're, like, loading a cannon or their muskets, they're pouring black powder into that. That's the same relative kind of thing. And if you see them, like, uh, fire the gun, you'll usually see that little puff of whiter mm -hmm. uh, gray smoke. Mm -hmm. That That's the, the... That's the key characteristic of black powder. Because right. modern smokeless powder, again, if you've fired a gun or if you've ever seen a video of it, it does put out a little puff of smoke, but it's relatively small. Black powder will have a huge you know, it's like a puff of smoke you're it's you can quickly surround you if you fire it from a musket or something like that it's going to quickly cover an entire battlefield if you have like you know thousands of guys shooting muskets or cannons all off at once that's why in fact sometimes in ancient well, not ancient but more like renaissance era or you know early modern battles or even like late in the middle ages when gunpowder was starting to become common battlefields just be covered in white smoke and it would take a while for both sides to even see each other after massive volleys because there's so much smoke covering the battlefield, they can't even see each other anymore. So the invention of smokeless powder was a huge step forward for development. I wonder if that's where the expression after the smoke clears comes from. Possibly. There is a lot of, you know, this is something I, I wasn't planning on talking about in the episode, but I'm glad you reminded me because there are a lot of common phrases that come from like, you know, muzzle loading firearms or muskets, like flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. That's from muskets. Uh, keep your powder dry. Hang fire, which is, that's an older expression for like lazy or to delay action. A hang fire is you say you've pulled the trigger and then it doesn't go off instantly. That the basically the delay is a hang fire, mm. so that's another one. There's a lot of different things. I'm sure I'm thinking of. I'm sure oh, lock, stock, and barrel. Yeah, that comes from muskets. There we go. That's the one I was trying to remember. I think that's all the ones I know off the top of my head. But yeah, for whatever reason, I guess muskets were just so common that they entered into like the common you know colloquialisms. There's a lot of phrases you get from firearms, which is interesting when you think about it. Yeah, it really is. And so the, this is something that just occurred to me too. I, I want to take a second just to talk about what I think might be a relatively common misconception about sure. the Chinese discovery of gunpowder. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was in school, I don't remember exactly when, but I remember I was taught that the Chinese invented gunpowder really long time ago and they did absolutely nothing with it. Yeah. <laughs> they maybe in, kind of invented fireworks and they liked that, but mm -hmm. they never used it for warfare. And it was the Europeans who really co-opted gunpowder for warfare. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely not true. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, I mean, it took them a couple hundred years to really figure out its potential, but they were still using gunpowder as uh, or gunpowder in 
firearms and in guns at least 200 years before the Europeans really started doing it. And that's the next story I'm going to tell you, actually, because that's right what I'm going to get into here. So, yes, that is a good misconception to dispel. So Europeans did start to very quickly develop their own firearms in domestic production, and they were responsible for a lot of important developments in firearms. Absolutely, yeah. But, again, they weren't the first people to weaponize it, nor were were they the first people to invent guns. It's more of Europe saw this great innovation, and when it made it to Europe, they very quickly developed their own separate arms industry, and then... They, they saw the potential in it very quickly. Yes, and in a lot of ways, their guns were better than the rest of the world's in anyway. a relatively short period of time. Yeah. But they, again, you're right, they did not... They, they didn't invent guns. They didn't invent guns. We, we will not be really be talking about Europe at all. No, we're, we're talking about the earliest examples here. Yeah. One day, maybe if we keep this series going, you know throughout the rest of the season here kind of intermittently we'll probably get to that at some point in fact i would love to talk about the development of the musket as mm-hmm. an interesting uh little i guess view into the history of a very iconic and yet also very uh i guess misunderstood weapon because i think a lot of people think they know a lot about muskets and they are relatively simple but there's also a decent amount of misconceptions about them so it might be fun to talk about that at yeah. some time. anyways getting back to black powder here we're roughly again in 850 80s let's move the timer up just a little bit It took a little while for black powder to find its way into weaponry. At first, again, it was used for fireworks and lighting various, like, signals. So, again, I guess around watchtowers and other sort of things that it did find uses for a lot of um, various military applications, I guess, in, like, celebrations or signals, but before it was actually used in warfare. Eventually, experiments at weaponizing gunpowder resulted in what is commonly cited as the first gun in history, the Chinese Fire Lance. And this is going to be a lot of the main body of this episode here talking about this specific innovation. Fire Lance is very interesting yeah very and, primitive but also very interesting yeah it's it's going to be an interesting odd story here so just bear with me also i should mention that bombs came in pretty early too yes. they might predate actual guns and fire lances it's a little bit hard to date when fire lances were truly made here because the fire lance was first introduced from what we know during the time of the song dynasty which for those of you who like me keep forgetting which dynasty is before what and after what those in chinese <laughs> no, the Song Dynasty is not the Mongols. That's oh. the Yuan. They're right before the Mongols. Right. So you're close. You're very close. I believe they are the ones the Mongols kicked out of power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, the earliest examples, again, date to the Song Dynasty, which is right around the 900s AD. And the Song Dynasty, again, falls in the later, I think mid to later uh, 1200s, if I remember correctly, right around yeah. the Mongol conquest yep. of China. So this is coming in right near the kind of early middle section of the Song Dynasty. And the weapon was probably used right around, again, the 900s or so, though we don't have records of the Fire Lances in actual combat until the 1100s. So Mm. it's possible they were being used for combat maybe 50 to 80 years after gunpowder was invented, which is pretty quick turnaround. But we can't really confirm it. We can only confirm it until about roughly two to 300 years after gunpowder is invented for sure. So it's hard to draw the line. Like, It's probable that it was before the 1100s, but documentation is unfortunately not that great because China has this nasty habit of collapsing every (laughs) couple hundred years. Collapsing isn't great for record. No, it's not, unfortunately. And also China does have a sad history of intentionally destroying such Mm -hmm. records when someone else comes into power. So Chinese history... Relatively recently. Yes. Unfortunately, China does have a lot of holes in its history that will probably never be filled. Yeah. That's the sad thing when talking about the history of this really interesting nation, various empires and people is that there's a lot of things we're never going to know. So anyways, it's debatable, getting back to Fire Lances, if these should count as true guns or not. Fire Lance is pretty much what the name suggests it is. It's a regular lance that has a bamboo, I guess, canister or tube full of gunpowder and shot attached to its head, probably by like rope or some other way of attaching it to the head of the lance. So you have your, you know, lance head, you know, like the actual little spear point. And then right next to that, you would have some sort of shot canister. And this is typically filled with rocks and again, gunpowder. Though I wouldn't doubt that they would also use basically whatever was available and good enough in the area and just shove that down the barrel. And what you do is, at least from what I've seen in the like, images of it, or I remember I've even found YouTube videos of people trying to recreate one, which, of course, again, kind of hit and miss on how accurate those are to history. But mm-hmm. from what I can gather, these, they would have like a wick or something that they would light and then they would point it in the general direction where it's supposed to shoot and just kind of hope it goes off the right way. Really, what you have is a lance with a little thing of explosives attached to it. So that's, like, it's, it's close. And again, in some ways, it's a very rudimentary musket with a bayonet on it. It's, it's kind of similar, although you can't really reload the thing. It's close enough, but you're, you're getting there. I, I'd imagine that those would probably be used more of, 
more for like shock factor. Yes, that is a, a scare tactic. That is but. something that the history does document pretty well. Is that people who fought this thing, who had not that great of a frame of reference for what was going on, were definitely startled by this. Mm-hmm. It was very demoralizing to you know see someone you're you like charging into a wall of lances is not fun already, but charging into a wall of lances and now things start suddenly exploding and there's a bunch of smoke in your face and you don't know what's going on. Pretty terrifying. And I, I believe there's accounts of them being successfully used against elephants as well. The, and that would scare an elephant mm-hmm. something fierce. That, mm-mm. No, that's not going to be good they at all. They also sound incredibly dangerous to operate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there is a very good chance it's just going to explode in your hands and kill the guy using it, too. That's also why, again, when talking about this, it's not really reloadable. I mean, maybe they got it right to where they could reload it once or twice, but the bamboo only holds up so well. Yeah. And again, it's very easy to pack it the wrong way. Way. so sure it might fire but now your bamboo tube is shredded even if it goes off the right way without hurting you so it's more of a fire and then you toss that aside and either run away or yeah, i'm assuming you grab some other weapon it's not really it's not a repeating arm by any means it's sort of like the uh roman legionaries uh javelin yeah you toss it you grab your galadius you run in yeah i i wouldn't doubt that the chinese had various different ways of fighting with the fire lance depending on you know who and where we're talking about Mm -hmm. that would be logical to you know give someone an actual spear or maybe like a bow or something else and then you have a fire lance for maybe a secondary or just a shock factor that would make sense to me though as we're talking about the fire lance here i should mention there are multiple different kinds in fact the next variation of the fire lance that came on down the line later doesn't have the actual lance head on it basically what they did is they took the bamboo tube and enlarged it got rid of the the spearhead and then stuck the bamboo tube on the end of a stick and now you have it looks kind of like a broomstick without a without a broom head on it and now you can use that and you have maybe a little bit more control on where the shot goes maybe it can probably hold a bit more and you're able to use it like you would hold it relatively like a gun this is where we're getting closer to an actual gun yeah. here rather than just a spear of some extra attachments on it this is when it's like okay again probably not reloadable you have to light a wick for it to go. It's it's getting close to like an early again it's very similar to a blunderbuss that you can only use once and you know doesn't have any sort of internal mechanism other than a wick so this is where we're getting to is this a firearm is this not a gun does it count it's really close and these things are going to be quite useful they would show up again i think roughly around the 1100s when you start to get the variations as far as i know they kept using fire lances up to i think even the 1500s or maybe a little bit uh earlier than that they were discontinued but they stuck Mm -hmm. around for a long time and a lot of different variations came around so it's interesting to note that this again single-use disposable weapon had such an impact on the world because after the fire lance is done that's when you start to see like you know wheel lock and match lock pistols because you get like rudimentary cannons are starting to show up you get hand cannons this is where it all starts it's just i i kind of wish we could have give like the floor to the audience here because i would love to hear what people think if this counts as a true gun quote unquote or not because i can see arguments either way it's definitely important for the development of modern day guns because without this you're probably not going to get actual gunpowder weaponry for a long long time because this is weaponized really early it shows up it has a lot of the same character characteristics of a gun but it also lacks a lot of them too so it's an interesting question to kind of debate this back and forth and really it's more of just a fun historical discussion it's not yeah. so much like a well i mean it's life and death if you're back in the 1200s <laughs> but maybe not life they, and they death. they also now. wouldn't be debating the These merits inherent and... characteristics of <laughs> what it means to be a they gun. would be too worried about using it to yeah. really <laughs> worry about the philosophical implications of if this is a gun and what's a gun anyways i'm a 1200s man in china so that's the history of potentially the first gun the chinese fire lance so. mm-hmm. That's the precursor to if you own a gun, which a lot of people do, I own multiple, you can trace back the lineage of, I guess, your little collection of guns all the way back to the Chinese Fire Lance, so so that you could thank people for. Now, I guess I do have a bonus fact for you Ooh, all, okay. uh, just because I remembered this one. I was going to mention in the list of things that aren't guns but are definitely related to guns there is the korean hawacha which i'm sure if any of you watch the history channel in the early 2000s you definitely heard about that it was also fascinating it was also discussed on mythbusters at one point where Mm. they tested it and these things i'm sure a lot of you know about these but just in case you've forgotten unique unit in civ 5 it is and six too they're also six six. so if any of you need a reminder these are the it's basically a little cart that the koreans invented right it's got two wheels on it and you have a bunch of metallic tubes i think anywhere from like 50 to 100 or maybe even more i'm sure there were some massive watches made right 
So you got these metallic tubes, and then you, inside of each tube, you stick an arrow, right? And then you basically are able to attach a little bit of propellant. So they're kind of like bottle rockets now, right? And there's a, there's a wick where when you light that, all of the wicks will start to burn on the arrows. And now all of a sudden, you basically have what could arguably be one of the earliest rocket launchers in human mm-hmm. history because now there's a hundred arrows all screaming at the enemy, right? And they are getting pelted of these things and they're flying pretty fast at an arc. So this is an example of a early rudimentary, again, artillery rocket launcher sort of piece. And again, it is gunpowder, I suppose. I think it had gunpowder actually on is how they would make it because yeah, it's basically like an early firework, but weaponized. I find these things really fascinating because they are the collision course of a lot of different, I guess, developments. And I I guess you want to count it industries, per se, all coming together to create a really cool weapon. So shout out to the Koreans for making, if not the first rocket launcher, definitely the coolest rocket launcher in all of human history. Do you know how effective it was in combat? Very, very effective. In fact, the Japanese invaded Korea at one point, right? Well, mm-hmm. actually, a couple times. But, <laughs> a couple but times. We're not, yeah. we're not going to talk about the more recent ones that are going to start a flame war, okay? <laughs> yeah. We're talking about the ones in, I think, was it 1300s? Something the, like that? The ones that no one can uh, alive can remember. Y- yeah. Oh, crap. Is it 1300s? Or, or is it later? Shoot. It's... it's um. I think it was later because... Uh, yeah, the, it was the... more like 1600s? Something like that? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're right because... Uh, Mongols tried to invade in the 13th century. They tried to invade Japan. They, yeah, they then failed. Japan had their own little little civil war in the, the 16th century. Yeah, and yeah, it's then, it's after that they tried yeah. to invade, try and fail to invade a Korea. It's the samurai invasion of Korea. There we go. Got the timeline right. So there are multiple accounts of various battles where hawachas were used against the invading samurai, and there'd be only a handful of Korean defenders, and there'd be a lot of Japanese samurai. Again, very skilled warriors. And they'd be trying to march up, say, to a siege of fort or up a hill or something like that. Well, turns out if you just have a few dozen Hawachas up there, or maybe even just a dozen, uh, they could fire faster than even some very well-trained archers can. And so now all of a sudden you have, what is it? Let's say you have 10 Hawachas and they all have 100 arrows each. You now have 1,000 arrows raining down on you. Yeah, if you just In have... In an instant. Yeah, let's say you have two guys for each Hawacha. I don't know how many people you typically need, but I just let's just say two. Like you one guy to probably light Probably have to have two. Two or so. One guy to cart it around and aim. One guy to light it to maybe load the arrows. And that's probably all you need. Now all of a sudden you can, you know, have a pretty solid battle against the samurai. Let's say they have a couple thousand guys and you have 24 or maybe a few hundred. Uh, yeah, you're going to give them a run for their money because if they're far enough away and you got a clear shot, they're going to be hurting. It's going mm-hmm. to be rough. So I was expecting to talk about the Hawacha so much. This is your bonus fact for the end of the day. I just find them really interesting. So there's a little bit about the Chinese Fire Lance, the first potential firearm in human history and one of the earliest rocket launchers in human history as well the hawacha so again thank all of you arms developers in east asia from you know millennia gone by you are all very fascinating people thank you for improving our lives with these fascinating various inventions that you've done so there you go i think that's all i got darian we're going to do next episode will be on cannons which i'm sure you're yes, gonna be able to go into we're a bit gonna more keep this uh flaming ball of fire rolling yeah <laughs> we're gonna, uh, talk about the equally oh, goodness nebulous gracious. uh origins <laughs> of the cannon yes there we go so th- there's our rapid fire episode for you all today <laughs> The complete opposite of what anything we talked about other than Hawatches does, because everything else we talked about fires incredibly slowly. And probably won't hit. <laughs> and for, Well, to be fair, this is one thing I did forget to mention about fire lances. They were only used within a couple of feet of people. Mm-hmm. They were not long-range weapons. It was, re- again, really a single-shot portable blunderbuss is the yep. best way to think about it. Is Look, here's a bunch of rocks and maybe nails. Look, that guy's five feet from me. All right, he's gone. Cool. Neat. I'll grab my spear now, and I guess I can keep fighting. A very important development in human history. <laughs> very, oh, yeah. <laughs> Change the face Monumental. of the world. Who knew? Who knew that if you're looking for immortality, you would find the complete opposite? <laughs> well, anyways, folks, again, thank you for listening. We'll catch you all next week where we talk about cannons and um, going off a bang. Bye.